Well, good morning, uh, and welcome to AEI and this morning's panel on congressional earmarks. Uh, I'm Gary Schmidt, a resident scholar here at AEI and director of the program on American citizenship, which focuses on uh, uh, various topics, civic education, uh, constitutional issues, and, and American institutions. Um, I want to thank you all for showing up on a miserable uh, first day of spring. Um, you're brave, courageous souls, and I really appreciate it. And I'd also like to welcome those on the internet uh, who are probably sitting at, uh, in a very comfortable chair with a coffee in front of them and maybe in their bathrobes. Uh, but anyway, uh, welcome to those folks as well. Uh, I'm joined today by really three outstanding uh, commentators on American politics and institutions. Uh, the bio, you, you have their bios, uh, but they're also online. But let me uh, introduce them with, for the short introduction to start. Uh, Francis Lee, uh, to my right, is a professor of government and politics at the Uni University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Lee is an author of several uh, award-winning books, uh, with the most recent being uh, Insecure Majorities, Congress, and the Perpetual Campaign, a book I highly recommend. Also, uh, Francis was uh, helpful, very helpful to us here at AEI uh, about a year and a half ago when we were doing a, a project on the state of congressional reform, its implications, and uh, it produced a book as Congress Broken. Well, she wasn't one of the authors. Uh, the truth is a lot of her own work was incorporated um, in it uh, by other scholars. So again, uh, we thank her for, for that help and, and being here this morning. Uh, to her right is Jay Cost. He's uh, an elections analyst, a political historian, and a senior writer at the Weekly Standard. Uh, Dr. Cost has written widely on the founding, political parties, and corruption, uh, large and small, in American politics. He's the author of three volumes, uh, the most recent uh, of which is A Republic No More, Big Government, and the Rise of American Political Corruption. Uh, next, uh, and, and by the way, we're going in the order that uh, our panelists will speak, uh, Jason Grummet is the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, previously, he founded and served as the executive director of the National Commission on Energy Policy. A uh, Harvard Law School graduate, uh, Jason is the author of another fine book called City of Rivals, Restoring the Glorious Mess of American Democracy. Um, well, the way we're going to proceed is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, each of the panelists will speak for about eight to ten minutes. Um, we'll have discussion back and forth among uh, us, but hopefully we'll leave sufficient amount of time that uh, you'll be able to ask questions um, and then we'll close everything up in about uh, 11 o'clock. Um, now let me begin by noting right at the start that there is no agreed definition of the term earmarks uh, that everyone is on board with. And indeed, if one looks at the White House OMB definition of earmarks, it appears to be anything that Congress does that is different from what the President's budget lays out a very sweeping view, uh, and a view I might add that's uh, been pretty much part of the White House view of Congress's budget authority since uh, the first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. But generally, what earmarks have come to mean is are funds set aside for a specific program, project, institution, or activity by an individual member of Congress. Uh, to paraphrase uh, a uh, Supreme Court justice uh, comment about pornography, with regard to earmarks, I know it when I see it. Uh, since 2011, uh, coincidental with the rise of the Tea Party, there's been a moratorium on the use of earmarks by members of Congress. But more recently, uh, there's been discussion and debate about whether that moratorium should be lifted, with pres both President Trump and Speaker Paul Ryan suggesting that this was an issue uh, that needed to be looked at. Uh, but, of course, at the same time, uh, a number of senators, uh, uh, Senator Jeff Flake, Senator McCain, um, Senator McCaskill, and others, have co-sponsored legislation which would turn this moratorium on earmarks into permanent law. So with that short background, let me uh, begin our discussion up here and turn to Professor Lee to start us off. Thanks very much, Gary, for convening this panel on this uh, interesting and important reform topic, and I, I appreciate the chance to be here. I'm here to advocate for Congress to reconsider its ban on earmarks. 
but I will title my point of view as two cheers for earmarks rather than three cheers because they are not without their problems. There are downsides and earmarks can be subject to abuse. But I argue that they serve a valuable purpose in representation. They forge ties between members of Congress and their local constituents. They promote deal making and bargaining in Congress because they give members concrete benefits from legislation. And it was a diminution of congressional power to abolish them. My starting point in making this recommendation is simply to recognize that being a member of Congress is a hard job. How do you demonstrate to your constituents that you're doing a good job as a member of Congress? An individual member can rarely take credit for what Congress as an institution does, for the, for the policies that Congress passes or doesn't pass. Except in extraordinary circumstances, a single member's vote or actions will not be decisive for outcomes. Senator Susan Collins or John McCain can chalk up a few occasions when they made a difference to the outcome, but most members don't have a chance to do this. What members have to show to their constituents is one, the political positions they take as individual members, and two, the tangible good things they do for their constituents. Long-term changes in American politics have in many ways eroded members' ability to perform on that second dimension, doing tangible good things for their constituents. They can still do casework, uh, helping their constituents navigate the federal bureaucracy, but they're much less able than in the past to produce tangible benefits in other ways. If one looks back, the 19th century Congress was all about the tangible benefits. Anybody who spends time examining the questions on which roll call votes were taken in the 19th century will discover that an exceedingly large share of them would run afoul of the contemporary earmark ban. The distribution of projects, narrow benefits, was a central preoccupation of the Congress of that era. Congress of that time period did not do regulatory policy to speak of. It didn't do entitlements. What it did do was distribute benefits. Public works projects were a substantially larger share of the federal budget than they are now. And they were funded in legislation that looked like what we'd call Christmas tree bills, long lists of project authorizations or earmarks, something for everybody. Roll call votes on such bills were almost always proposals to undertake or not undertake a specified project in some specified location. Building a courthouse or a post office in Peoria or Minneapolis or Omaha, a, a lighthouse on the Potomac, the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad. Likewise, when the 19th century Congress considered questions relating to taxes, these were usually not questions that were general in their application, aimed at reducing or increasing overall revenue or affecting the progressivity of the tax code. In fact, there wasn't an income tax. They dealt with very narrow proposals, such as to eliminate the tax on tobacco or to reduce the tax on spirits or oleomargarine, very controversial oleomargarine, uh, preserve the taxes on matches, playing cards, perfumery. More broadly, American politicians of that era were far more concerned with the spoils of office than are their counterparts today. The amount of patronage was enormous. Before 1883, the whole public service, federal, state, and local, was available to distribute to loyal partisans. Senators themselves often headed up patronage networks. One of the best known was headed up by New York Senator Roscoe Conkling, one of the most vocal opponents of civil service reform, which he referred to as snivel service reform. Uh, he, he said, and this is sort of, a, I find this a telling quotation, he said that parties are not built up by deportment or by ladies' magazines or by gush. In other words, what Conkling was saying was that politics was about the tangible good things you can do for people, not the statements you make or the positions you take. Congressional parties and politicians of the late 19th century trafficked more in tangible benefits and less in political positioning. Reforms over the long sweep of history since the Civil War have steadily eroded the viability of this style of representation. Civil service reform removed most government jobs from patronage networks. 
Reciprocal trade agreements reduced Congress's ability to engage in the pork barrel politics of tariff rate setting, good by good. Rather than designating projects one by one, the 20th Century Congress built up bureaucratic agencies to administer grants, or is instead opted to allocate money on a formula basis to states. Across the board, the opportunities uh, have decreased for a member of Congress to point to a tangible benefit and say to constituents, I did this for you. Since the middle of the 20th century, the size of the pork barrel has continued to shrink. If one examines the trends in the types of federal expenditures that are most focused on directing federal benefits to geographic constituencies, they've all been declining. Funding for transportation, community development, water projects, military construction, all are lower as a proportion of federal expenditures today than they were in 1962. There's just not much pork barrel left. And in the context of all those other long-term changes, Congress adopted its earmark ban. Earmarks had been one remaining way for members to direct benefits to their constituents. Note, however, that earmarking only allowed them to lay claim to expenditures that were going to be made anyway. In transportation funding, for example, Congress would specify aggregate amounts to go to state departments of transportation for various purposes, and then they would earmark particular projects as high priority in particular locations. So earmarking just meant that Congress was jockeying for pieces of a shrinking pie. Earmarks were never drivers of federal spending overall or of budget deficits, despite a lot of political rhetoric that suggested otherwise. Even as earmarks exploded in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, aggregate uh, federal outlays did not increase. So now in today's context, what are members left with as a way to show that they're doing a good job as members of Congress? There's hardly any opportunity for them to take individual credit for benefits uh, provided to constituents anymore. But what members do have is an opportunity to take attractive political positions. To maximize the political value of one's issue positions, it helps to keep them unclouded by any stances that might be unpopular with one's constituents. One is thus for programs, policies, or tax reductions without ever clearly specifying how exactly they will be paid for. One is for reducing the budget deficit, but, not, but doing so without cutting any programs one constituents, one's constituents like or raising any taxes. In the world of political position taking, there's no downside to being full pie in the sky for being uh, in favor of all gain and no pain. If one state or district has a clear partisan lean one way or another, which most of them do, a member who is primarily concerned with preserving the value of issue, his issue position portfolio will not agree to compromises that would endanger his or her reputation for ideological reliability. When your positions are all you've got as your political calling card, best to keep them pure. So it strike me, strikes me that the incentives have gotten a bit out of balance. It's not to say that we should go back to the 19th century world of patronage and favor trading. We shouldn't go back on civil service reform or go back to setting tariffs product by product. But earmarks are and were a way to give members something tangible to care about when considering a legislative package. They were something to care about aside from what their vote might do to the ideological purity of their voting record. Getting rid of earmarks really did make for a significant change in how members of Congress related to their constituents. When earmarks existed, local groups of every stripe would come in to their member of Congress to pitch their ideas. Nonprofits, universities, cities, towns, they all had their projects they wanted funded. These kinds of requests kept members of Congress in close touch with the concrete needs and desires of local constituents. And the existence of earmarks allowed them to do specific, real-world good things for their constituents. Those tangible benefits also gave members a political stake in the success of legislation that's often lacking when there's nothing on the line that members can claim credit for. The loss of earmarks has made life more challenging for coalition leaders in Congress who now have less ability to get members invested in the success of their efforts. Now, that's not to say that there aren't problems with earmarks. Obviously, they can be, they can be subject to corruption and self-dealing, 
Members of Congress should not make national policy that they think is contrary to the public interest simply because they've extracted a side payment in the form of an earmark. Less well known, this kind of patronage politics is very time consuming. When every local group wants to meet with a member of Congress to seek an earmark, it's burdensome on members and staff time. It's hard to know what criteria to use to select among all the requests seeking funding to determine which ones are truly worthy. So despite these downsides, I see the loss of this last form of tangible benefit that members can provide as putting representation somewhat out of balance. Members seeking to shore up constituency opinion of them wind up having to focus almost entirely on the political positions they take as opposed to the benefits that they can provide to constituents because there are so few benefits that are available to them to distribute. Thanks, Francis. Jay. Well, thank you very much for having me uh, at the panel, Gary. I, I am um, a, an opponent of uh, reinstating earmarks, at least as they existed uh, prior to the ban in 2010. But um, that's not to say that a, a hypothetical earmark regime, I, I could be brought around to supporting it. Um, I take earmarks primarily in theory at least, as an effort to solve the collective action problem inherent to Congress, which is just basically boils down to the fact that you get 535 members across two branches, how are you going to actually induce them to behave on behalf of the collective good of the nation, right? That's certainly one possibility. They could coordinate themselves in such a way as to, you know, legislate on behalf of the general welfare. But there are other possibilities that oftentimes are more uh, frequent, like gridlock, for instance. They could simply do nothing. They could not come to some agreement, and each member sort of looking out for his own personal interests or the parochial interests of his districts. Ultimately, nobody's willing to make the necessary sacrifices for the general welfare of the whole. Uh, so that would yield gridlock. Uh, another possibility, and, and arguably my opinion a, a more dangerous one, is what James Madison would call majoritarian factionalism. Right, just because a numerical majority exists doesn't mean that it actually represents the interests of the whole community. The principle of majority rule is not in and of itself a normative principle, it's more of a heuristic to sort of to say that the majority is more likely than not to repre represent the interests of the whole community. Uh, that need not necessarily be the case, and indeed that was one of the animating concerns of the Founding Fathers when they forged the national government in 1787 was their anxiety about narrow majorities in the state governments uh, legislating on behalf of the, the, the parochial factions that amounted to a majority within their states and doing so at the expense of the national interest. So for instance, a good example of that would be the way uh, loyalists to the British cause were dispossessed of their property and had their rights violated they were an easy political target in the 1780s. They did not constitute a majority. But in so doing, uh, the state governments aggregated, a, excuse me, aggravated the British, uh, violated the terms of the Treaty of Paris of 1783, and gave the British an excuse to remain in the Northwest Territory. So that's an example of majoritarian factionalism. So the question is, how do you induce a legislative body, or any collective body for that matter, but in this case, Congress, how do you induce Congress to govern on behalf of the general welfare of the nation rather than doing nothing or rather than engaging in majoritarian factionalism? Now, I think that um, Americans have had what um, Alexander Hamilton would call a kind of uh, naive faith in the pure patriotism of politicians. Um, this has long been sort of a feature of American government that we don't expect uh, members of Congress to gain any kind of personal benefit from public service. So, for instance, um, Benjamin Franklin at the Constitutional Convention actually recommended that legislators go without pay. Now, this is a terrible idea. Uh, Franklin, bless his heart, was voted down on that, um, overwhelmingly so. But you see this time and again through American history, where, for instance, uh, the Congress that was elected, the, the, uh, the post-war Congress of 18, um, 
15, 18, 16 was an extraordinarily productive Congress. Uh, they passed a protective tariff. They uh, chartered a second bank of the United States. But at the end of the session, they voted for themselves a pay raise. They moved from going to having a per diem pay to a, an annual pay. And the public responded in outrage and voted them all out of office. Uh, similarly, there was a similar outcry in 1873, the so-called salary grab. Public doesn't like things like that. In my home state in Pennsylvania in 2006, uh, there was public outrage about a salary increase. Um, and and, and uh, more recently than that, even, you know, when the uh, congressional Republicans took control of the House again in 2011, first thing they did was cut the budget of Congress as if the main problem with our government is that the most representative of the three branches is somehow underfunded. Um, it speaks to this sort of penny-wise, pound-foolish attitude or orientation that just sort of has existed in American politics since really the beginning, right, that we're supposed to be motivated by the highest spirits. Um, and I think that uh, earmarks sort of speak against that, right? The idea of an earmark is, um, in, a, in its ideal form, an earmark would be a way, a, a benefit for a member of Congress for um, engaging in collective action for the good of the nation, that they get some sort of benefit that they can take home that's really, it's for their district, but it also enhances their reelection prospects, and it also enhances their honor and esteem back in the district. So. And this is something. This is this is something that is actually useful in politics. Uh, that as long as there has been this sort of um, doe-eyed kind of ideal that members of Congress uh, act completely selflessly, there's been also the more hard-bitten acknowledgement that that's not how things are supposed to work. So I want to um, quote for you. This is a speech that Hamilton gave at the Constitutional Convention. He advised. Uh, this was on a debate about whether or not members of Congress could simultaneously hold offices outside the legislative branch. This was a, a high point of anxiety uh, for, uh, for the founders. Hamilton advised against taking a hard line on this. He said, take mankind as they are, and what are they governed by? Their passions. There may be in every government a few choice spirits who may act more on, for more worthy motives, but our great error is that we suppose mankind more honest than they are. Our prevailing passions are ambition and interest, and it will ever be the duty of a wise government to avail itself of those passions. And in the speech, Hamilton made reference to an essay by David Hume, uh, the the one of the you know the, one of the preeminent thinkers of the of the Scottish Enlightenment, an essay that Hume wrote. Um, in 1742 entitled Of the Independence of Parliament. And in that essay, Hume noted uh, that the House of Commons, that in theory, the power of the House of Commons is, uh, he said that it was so great that it absolutely commands all the other parts of government. But he noted that the House of Commons doesn't actually exercise its full, full authority. And so he asked, how shall we solve this paradox? Hume's, Hume's answer was patronage, right? He said, I answer that the interest of the body, in other words, the commons, is here restrained by that of the individuals, and that the House of Commons stretches not its power, because such a usurpation would be contrary to the interest of the majority of its members. The crown has so many offices at its disposal that when assisted by the honest and disinterested part of the house, it will always command the resolutions of the whole, so far at least as to preserve the ancient constitution from danger. So what Hume is saying there was that the ancient constitution of of Great Britain where the king rules with parliament and the parliament rules with the lords is preserved by basically the crown's civil list. It's access to parliament or to, to patronage independent of the appropriations of the commons. Um, earmarks sort of fit into that, right? Earmarks are sort of a, a similar, a, a form of patronage for members of Congress, sort of a side benefit that they can receive for participating in some great collective endeavor. That's that's the theory. But I, in my judgment, earmarks in practice uh, over the course of state, in the 1990s and into the 2000s, earmarks uh, fell far short. So I, I would not be able to support um, a reinstitution of an earmark regime without major renovations. Uh, I have a couple 
objections. The first is that the earmark system was uh, very inefficient. Um, you know, it, the way that it worked, well, uh, just some numbers would suffice. Um, that what you really see is sort of an exponential growth in earmarks. So in 1992, the uh, earmarks cost $2.7 billion, and there were approximately 1,000 of them. In 1997, the price increased to $14.5 billion, and there were 1,500 of them. In 2006, there, were tw there was $29 billion spent in earmarks and 14,000 of them. And staffers for the relevant committees, the appropriations subcommittees, complained that they were deluged with earmark requests. And they also complained that members were over asking. So what's the problem with earmarks? Why is there this inefficiency? Well, it, uh, one anecdote I would, I would provide is sort of the 1990 uh, transportation uh, reauthorization bill. They used earmarks to sort of swing a couple of members over to uh, vote for the transportation bill. But other members who had offered their votes early on saw that withholding their votes was able to get their, their colleagues extra benefits. So four years later, when the transportation bill came up for reauthorization, more members withheld their votes. Um, and so that's really a, a kind of a problem with earmarks is, is that it, it lends itself to a kind of inefficiency of over asking and once you realize that there's sort of a side benefit for you to get you're going to become less likely to facilitate the collective endeavor i also um just it, it you know if you dig into the earmarks you'll see that there is a real bias toward leadership in who gets the earmarks and also a bias to economic and political elites within the districts are the prime beneficiaries of earmarks and remember earmarks are mediated sources of benefits for for whole districts Right, so you you know you're you're not an earmark is a, a money that's spent for a specific program. It's not dollars that are distributed impartially to every constituent. Now, arguably, every constituent is going to receive. Uh, or in theory, every constituent will receive some benefit from an earmark. But in practice, right, there are going to be direct beneficiaries of the earmark and indirect beneficiaries of the earmark. And the direct beneficiaries of the earmarks tend to be the most politically uh, connected uh, constituencies within the district, the economic elites. And another factor with earmarks that we cannot overlook is the potential for corruption. Right, which gets back to the fact that members of Congress nowadays are very, very wealthy. They've done very well for themselves. Usually an enormous amount of wealth is a prerequisite for getting into Congress, and that means that they have a lot of economic interests within their district. They have a lot of business ongoing. They own property. And time and time again, if you go through the list of earmarks, you will see, what do you know, this earmark happened to, you know, uh, build a new on ramp that's just a couple miles away from property that the di that the that the 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 representative owned. And as as somebody who I bought my house before uh, they built a new on on ramp, and I and when they built an on ramp, the value of my house increased by fifty percent. I mean, this sort of stuff is much more common than you would think. There's very little policing to be done about this as well, because that's another problem with earmarks: is that they're very inscrutable. It's very difficult to sort of tease out what's going on, and also they happen outside the regular processes of uh, you know hearings and stuff. They're just sort of inserted into these appropriations bills. The corruption aspect of this cannot be underestimated, not just in terms of monetary value, but there's already a sense in the American public at large that members of Congress are out to line their own pockets and that they're not looking out for their constituents' interests. And when you see these stories about, well, what do you know? You know, I, I happen to own this piece of property, and we had an earmark for a transportation bill to widen the road right outside my piece of property. And every member, every time, can make an argument that says, no, 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 we only, I only did this because it was good for my district. I mean, every time they can make that. So you really can't. That's one of the problems with political corruption is that it's, it's very, very difficult to, to, um, to illustrate in some kind of definitive way. I mean, you look at the way Bob, Bob Menendez was able to be, uh, you know, got managed to get himself a hung jury uh, because he said that he and, you know, Dr. Melgen, well, we're just friends. I mean, what's the difference between a quid pro quo relationship and friendship? It's actually very, very hard to distinguish. But that, 
even though you can't make distinct distinctions on an individual level, you see instance after instance after instance after instance of members uh, sending money to districts that benefit their own economic interests, and you cannot but conclude that something is going on. We don't know which one of these members was doing it, but at least one of them was. So I would suggest, um, again, to quote Hamilton, that there's inconveniencies on both sides, is what he said in that, in that, uh, in, in, in that speech to the convention, right? On the one hand, we ha it's, it's necessary to create uh, incentives for members of Congress to operate on behalf of the public good rather than their own parochial interests, um, and also rather than doing nothing. Uh, but I, and, I, and earmarks, in theory, um, could be something uh, uh, could be a tool to do that, but I would I think that what you need um, is more central direction to earmark. So something closer, uh, not what Hume sort of suggested, which was the king actually dispenses earmarks, but some sort of system whereby it's not left up to subcommittee chairman. Uh, and it's not done through committees. It's actually done through maybe the party leadership or something like that uh, to actually induce collective action and, and actually begin to do some actual policing on what these earmarks are to weed out members who are clearly just inserting things to, you know, indirectly line their own pockets. And, and I think that the, the theory of earmarks is a sound theory, but the history of it between 1990 and 2006 demonstrates that it's, it's, it's inefficient and it does lend itself to corruption. So those would be my two main objections to it in practice. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Jason? Sure. Well, I got to tell you, I came here this morning expecting a lot more controversy. Um, I am uh, yeah, so did very I. much in agreement <laughs> with Francis, and I think um, I understand some of Jay's earmark ambivalence, which I think are kind of answerable challenges. So I'm going to try to avoid the usual everything's been said, but not everyone has said it, and not repeat all of these different um, good inputs and focus a little bit on some of the practical and then just probably tell you a couple of stories. Um, I think there's three reasons why we should be bringing back directed congressional spending. I get the fact that no one else will ever call it directed congressional spending. Earmarks is uh, the burden that we bear, just like fracking will forever haunt the natural gas industry. Um, bad branding. Um, but the first is that it will enable Congress, I think, to make tough decisions. The second is that I think, as um, you heard, earmarks don't increase the debt. Um, the effort to ban earmarks ultimately, I think, has been an incredible head fake by members of Congress who have sought to look fiscally prudent while, in fact, doing exactly the opposite. Um, as Jay said, we do have this kind of righteous um, effort towards uh, kind of immaculate dysfunction in this country where we, in fact, forget the real realities of how people make decisions. Um, and then finally, and I'll just kind of focus on this, the process must and can quite easily be reformed. Um, just to kind of lay my frame on this, uh, I think the unique aspect of American democracy is that people are elected by local interests and asked to serve in the national interest. And when we call upon Congress to be courageous and make tough decisions, what we're basically asking them to do is take votes that are necessary for the national interest that anger their constituents. And guess what? Um, they're loath to do that when, in fact, they don't have political capital back home. So I have been arguing, contrary to uh, the you know, general stream, that if we care about the deficit, bringing back earmarks is probably the single most important practical thing we can do. Congress has demonstrated over the last $20 trillion that it does not, in fact, have the capacity to make those tough decisions. And while earmarks are messy, if we compare them to the reality rather than the perfect, I think we would see a much more functional uh, institution. Um, just a minute about the kind of budgetary impacts. We've talked about the fact that it's a zero-sum budget. What we haven't again talked about is the practicality of what happens if Congress is not authorized to spend that 1% that in fact was kind of the peak of earmarks. What happens is that our bureaucrats do it. And I am personally um, a big fan of the bureaucracy, probably more than most of you in the room. Some of my best friends are public servants. That said, I don't believe that they have any greater insight or transparency or capacity to disassociate themselves from decisions than elected members of Congress who ultimately have to do something that is approved by the entire body. So again, if we have an actual comparison of how the spending decisions are made, 
I think that argues to restore some congressional prerogative. Um, and again, just the broader fiscal um, issue is that there are tremendous costs of these close shutdowns, these threatened debt defaults. Um, you know, we are now going into the fifth CR. The big challenge right now seems to be a tunnel to somewhere as opposed to the uh, bridge to nowhere. Um, I also think it's important to be able to put um, you know, both sides of the issue on the table. So the bridge to nowhere is this wonderful symbol. Um, it, it wasn't actually adopted, which is certainly worth noting. But I would counter the bridge to nowhere with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. We have a Civil Rights Act in 1964 because we built a NASA research center at Purdue University. The bill was stuck in the House Rules Committee where the Democrat, Judge Smith, refused to move it forward. Johnson had to get support from the Republican minority leader, Halleck, to move the bill out of the Rules Committee. They went back and forth, and you can imagine the colorful nature of the conversations when finally Johnson says, Charlie, what the do you need to make this happen? And Halleck says this is tough for him, and it's going against his party. And then he mentions that it would really be great if this NASA Research Center were built at his alma mater, Purdue University. My guess is that southwestern uh, Indiana is not necessarily the best place to study the cosmos, but um, I take that deal. So if you look back at most significant pieces of legislation, there has always been some transactional nature, which I will come back to. I want to spend three minutes just talking about the kinds of reforms that are plausible, because I think everyone agrees with Jay's uh, conclusion that the you know, bad old days of 1997 was um, not something we should aspire to. But again, there's lots we can do. Here's my uh, top 10 list. Um, first of all, and just broadly, the purpose and the process of earmark should presume that members of Congress desire attention, because these are good things, and they should use the regular legislative process. In fact, if we required earmarks to go through the regular legislative process, it could actually provide an incentive to use the regular legislative process, which would be a quite salutary impact on our democracy. So first, we should require all members of Congress, as was required uh, in you know, around 2000, to assert that they nor their family members have any economic interest whatsoever in these projects. Now, obviously, members of Congress can lie, as can lawyers and doctors and accountants and everybody else, but we should have that right up front. We should prohibit earmarks to for-profit corporations. We should limit the number of earmarks that any member can get. And we should limit the total amount of earmarks to 1%, which I think the appropriations committees have the capacity to do. We are in the information age. These projects should be loud and proud. They should be posted on committee websites. They should be posted on member websites at least two weeks before they're considered. We should only allow earmarks on programs that have actually been authorized. A lot of congressional spending right now happens on programs that never made it through the authorization process. If you could only address earmarks on authorized programs, you provide an incentive to authorize federal spending. We should require earmarks to be included in legislative text, not in report language, so that they actually are available to actual amendment. We should prohibit new earmarks in these manager amendments and omnibus bills. This was one of the real big problems. We, we called it midnight dumping. You know, a couple of days before the bills go through, dozens or hundreds of earmarks were added where there was no opportunity for real consideration. We should prohibit earmarks for programs that have peer-reviewed decisions, like NIH, right? If the government actually has a peer-reviewed process, that should um, you know, be preeminent. And finally, uh, I think Congress should look back. Because these are such a high-profile question, the GAO, or the right institution, should be empowered and funded to go review and audit some of these projects with the capacity to claw back resources if, in fact, there was a determination of wasteful spending. So, there's a lot you can do. I'm sure there are many more ideas. I think you know, Jay's notion of kind of centralizing the authority has um, some obvious tangible benefits to create those incentives for collaboration. But let me just end with um, a couple of more maybe accessible points. The first is that every authentic human relationship is transactional. I am visiting my wife's in-laws for Thanksgiving. <laughs> she did the taxes. I am driving up to the Zava frickin' zone on Sunday for a birthday party in nowhere, and she's going to the honors chorus, which is, I got the better deal on that one. 
that's how we relate to each other. And the idea that members of Congress should somehow be different, I think, is this kind of quaint notion that has really no bearing in reality. And finally, I've been trying to think about, you know, how can you explain what earmarks are to people who are not part of this process? And driving in this morning, it occurred to me that they're almost exactly like um, snacks in the office kitchen. So snacks in the office kitchen are one of the lowest cost, highest value opportunities to create a sense of camaraderie and engagement. You keep people in the office, people are focused, they meet in the kitchen, good thing. Every time we have a budget crisis, the Bipartisan Policy Center, which happens, we don't quite have this building yet, everybody you know, comes up with some exercise. How do we cut costs? Every time, snacks in the kitchen. Well, you know, it's one-tenth of one percent, but they're, they're these kind of visible examples of trying to pr prove to your board of directors that you're somehow, we're not cutting the $800,000 modeling budget, but we're going to cut snacks in the kitchen. So again, it's the same kind of um, high-profile silliness. And finally, I realized that we actually had our own snacks in the kitchen Abramoff problem. A couple of years ago, we got these Welch's fruit snacks. I don't know if you know these things. They're, they're, of course, they're not real fruit. They're disgusting, and they're habit-forming. <laughs> we started eating these things like crazy. They were actually kind of expensive, and there was also a little corruption. People started bringing them home for the long commute. A couple apparently even turned up in kids' school lunches the following day. Did we eliminate snacks in the kitchen? No. We reformed the process. And in fact, our health prevention team got involved. So in addition to getting rid of the fruit snacks, we got rid of the Doritos are now pop chips. We got some almonds in there. Now, of course, some of the reforms were fake. So we brought in those granola bars, which everyone knows are just Snickers and drag, right? But we did our best. And so that's my you know, kind of recommendation to Congress, which is to kind of bring back the pop chips, a healthy version of a snack in the kitchen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank God you're not looking at my pantry. Uh, that's right. that's, um, before we, uh, before I get a chance to ask questions and turn to the audience, uh, anything, Francis, that comes to mind you want to reflect on, or Jay? Okay. Well, then I'll be an immoderate moderator and begin with a sort of broad question. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about the debate about earmarks is whether you know. Uh, I mean, the debate tends to focus on earmarks in the process. Um, and the, the larger question is, given the state of polarization today, and given, let's say, the state of the appropriation process, um, are, we, are we really talking small potatoes or marginal difference uh, if we, if we uh, were to uh, reinstitute earmarks? In other words, is the dynamics in Congress such that, that you know, you know, let's say that we could come up with a, um, a positive earmark process that everybody would sort of basically agree to. Would it make much of a difference? Um, well, I think there's, that's a legitimate question. I mean, I, and I think that, you, you know, um, Congress has become increasingly polarized ideologically. And I think that uh, especially on, in the Republican caucus, there is a group of members, you know, um, who are, the, you know, the Freedom Caucus um, is not, I don't think that they can be bought, so to speak, um, but by earmarks. And insofar as they hold the balance of power on major bills, and they often do, I mean, because the Freedom Caucus, you know, can't be sort of taken in isolation. They have to be taken in the context of the relatively narrow split between Republicans and Democrats within the, um, within the chamber itself. And then also, um, the, the, the strong partisan opposition between the two sides where the two sides are not interested in working together really any much anymore. So that insofar as the Freedom Caucus holds the balance of power, which they often do under Republican governments, I'm, I'm not sure the earmarks would be uh, very beneficial. I, don't, I, I think that, in fact, um, I think a lot of them, if, if you look at the way, like for instance, if you look at at, at Ted Cruz's behavior in 2015, 2014, that there's a lot of hay to be made in terms of rep, reputational advantages for somebody, depending on their district, by decrying things like earmarks and sort of embarrassing your colleagues by, by things like that. So I, I, I think that you can't underestimate those problems in using earmarks as a bene, beneficial tool.
I don't think they would make a dramatic difference. I, I think that we ought to think about earmarks not as a question of buying votes. I don't think that it's a matter of members doing what they think is not in the public interest in exchange for some side payment. I don't think that that's how it works. I think it's closer to the example that Jason brought forward of Charlie Halleck on the Civil Rights Bill, which is members who are inclined to think that taking a tough vote is in the national interest, but it is tough, and they like to have something that they can point to that they can say to constituents, well, this, makes, this helps make it worth it. This was why I took the stance that I did. It's, it's, kind of, it's, it's a matter of getting a little political cover for something that you want to do rather than uh, you know, something that's going to buy your vote over your personal objections. So to the extent that there's ideological polarization in Congress, which there is, and members who have competing notions of the public interest, I don't think earmarks is going, would solve that. Mm -hmm. But under circumstances where members are inclined to take a tough vote, but it's, it's hard to get over the hump, earmarks can help them do it. Yep. Just to add a couple quick thoughts. I would start out by um, quoting a prominent national leader with, you know, what do we have to lose? Um, the congressional process is broken. And so the notion that we should be risk averse to preserve the current functioning of Congress, I think, is um, a bit questionable. And they, they'll help a little. You know, I've talked to a dozen or so members of Congress in a non-scientific way, mostly junior members, and just posed the question, would this be useful for you? And as Francis points out, they basically say, it would help my constituents know who I am. It would give me some ability to articulate, you know, what my priority is, and I'd have a foundation upon which to kind of press my own case. I could be the one to build the opioid you know, recovery center. I could be the one to expand the VA treatment center. And that that would, in fact, give them some anchor of ego and identity, which you know, hopefully, to some extent, would give them more courage to authorize the use of military force and to occasionally pay for tax cuts and to vote for the debt ceiling. Um, you know, maybe not, but you know, a dozen votes would matter a lot in some of these pieces of legislation. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. This one is uh, mostly directed at, at, at Jay, uh, just because uh, we share, we both went to the University of Chicago. I studied political theory uh, in American institutions and the founding, so uh, so he's in sort of my sweet spot when he's been talking about sort of the Hume and, and Hamilton. Let me posit sort of, a, well, let me begin by talking about an um uh, incident that happened not too long after uh, Republicans banned uh, earmarks uh, or put a moratorium on earmarks in, in 2011. Um, I, I was sitting next to a senator who had just recently been appointed to the Appropriations Committee. Um, and I and I joke uh, to that senator, who, whose gender will remain <laughs> unknown, um, well, that's kind of sad. You've You've gotten your seniority, and you finally got on the Appropriations Committee, and they've pulled the rug out from under you for the reason for, not simply the reason, but one of the reasons why you wanted to be on the Appropriations Committee. And that particular senator just, you know, smiled and nodded. Um, but it was clear that, you know, uh, uh, the senator understood the new rules were not going to play to her benefit in the same way that the rules had played in the years preceding. So, let, I mean... Let me posit that, that, Jay, you're right, that a lot of these things are done for um, corrupt purposes. And I don't, I mean, small corruption, right? You know, like um, Denny Hassard buys land in Illinois and the highway goes and his, you know, his, his land is now worth a you know, million dollars as opposed to $500,000 or something like that. Um, isn't Hume's point that this still has benefits in that it, you know, going back to the senator, that one of the benefits of this kind of small level corruption is that it allows for incentives for seniority. Um, it pushes things back towards committees as opposed to uh, just the leadership making all these decisions. In other words, isn't there kind of a second order benefit to uh, earmarks slash corruption that Hume's really talking about um, and that the price to be paid is this kind of, you know, corruption that we have to, you know, not necessarily accept at large levels, but accept at some level. Yeah, um, Hume said uh, 
the end of his essay, uh, very classic Hume, he said, we may therefore, therefore give to this influence what name we please. We may call it by the invidious appellations of corruption and dependence, but some degree and some kind of it are inseparable from the very nature of the Constitution and necessary to the preservation of our mixed government. I mean, Hume's point there was that this is serving a broader purpose, right? That this was, so this small corruption was serving a broader public interest, right? Um, and I'm not opposed to that, um, and I and I think we need we need to bear in mind um, that this is this is small potatoes, uh, but I also want to highlight uh, that small potatoes in the history of Congress, particularly in the 19th century, before the executive really got handholds on the process of spending and allocating money, that small corruption can and has spiraled into large corruption. Um, distributive politics, which is what we're really talking about here, uh, is, a, is a tool uh, that really can be very, very dangerous. Because um, if you look at, it, you know, Madison in Federalist 10, he says, you know, one of the advantages of a extended republic such as the United States is that it will make majority factions more difficult to form. A large, diverse country, it's very unlikely that some economic interest or social interest will, um, will, will be large enough to actually control the government. And if there does exist some sort of majoritarian sentiment, it will be harder to form under, uh, under the guise of, uh, under the constraints of the extended republic. But as the 18, after, after, the, uh, after the War of 1812, Congress really began the practice of engaging in distributive politics. Uh, and the primary mechanism by which it did so was through the protective tariff, that the protective tariff under the, under the ostensible national purpose of providing for national defense, uh, which was the stated purpose in 1816, but in 1824 and then in 1828, it increasingly became a way to uh, sort of line the pockets of regional, uh, regional um, groups. And what happened was the opponents of the protective tariff, like Calhoun and, uh, and John Randolph of Roanoke and John, uh, John Taylor of Caroline pointed out that this was actually a way around the logic of Federalist 10 is that uh, I think uh, uh, Carol, T Taylor called it the tariff of 1824 bill of bargains. Right, so there was no economic interest in the country that was large enough to basically just line its own pockets. But what happened was the the woolens industry of the Mid Atlantic united with the iron industry in Western Pennsylvania, and they roped in the wheat growers in the in the Midwest to basically stick it to the South. Right, was basically was the complaint, uh, and something similar like this happened on a massive scale after World War II or excuse me, after the Civil War, where the entirety of Americans' um, the United States political economy was really sort of reducible to this Republican Party log roll, where you had protective tariffs primarily to benefit Republican constituencies and donors in the Midwest and in New England. You had a sound money to facilitate international trade, also very good for the financial interests that banked rolled the Republican Party. Um, and then the, the spare revenue from the tariffs was used for the distribution of pensions to uh, Civil War veterans who were the critical votes in places like New York and Indiana and Ohio, which is one reason why Grover Cleveland holds the record with a bullet for the number of vetoes, because Cleveland as a Democrat had no interest in sustaining uh, this Republican uh, log roll coalition. So my concern is sort of uh, on the specifics of uh, Earmarks as they existed under the previous regime, I would suggest that they were inefficient. Maybe they had second order benefits, but their inefficiencies I think overwhelmed them. But in general, as sort of a general principle, the politics of, of distribution, of lend itself to big corruption potentially. And it's something we have to be mindful of because it's not just sort of a theoretical concern. It actually happened at several different points under several different political economies in the 19th century where di distributive politics ends up becoming the whole purpose of the government and really you get something like majoritarian factionalism, which as Madison rightly noted is in a, in a Republican government, that's really the poison pill. 
right? Because majority factions can't be defeated at the ballot box. That's really dangerous. I just want to add a, a small, I think, important point. I you know, acknowledge that Jay's vesting his views in Hume and Madison, and I'm talking fruit snacks. Um, I think we have to differentiate between personal enrichment and political enrichment. Under no circumstance should the country tolerate personal enrichment. That's not to say that it doesn't sometimes happen. Many illegal things sometimes happen, which is why we care about them. But we should have a vigorous effort to make certain that members of Congress are not trying to find personal benefit for themselves or their families. The fact that there are many members of Congress who will never abide by earmarks and many organizations like Taxpayers for Common Sense, Heritage, and others, there will be ample scrutiny on this stuff. I and I think Francis are arguing, though, that political enrichment is, in fact, a very good thing that there would be spillover benefits. And so I think it is important not to casually use the word corruption as something that we embrace, because I think that implies a support for that kind of personal enrichment. I actually don't think that in the, you know, even the run up to the massive earmarks, you had Duke Cunningham, you had criminals. Um, but I don't think that, you know, personal financial enrichment was a dominant factor, even when earmarks were out of control. Go ahead, Francis. I would just say, you know, that you can't take the politics out of politics and that there is, I mean, government engages in distribution. The question with, uh, that we're really engaging with today is what's Congress's role in that? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a substantial and growing literature in political science showing that, uh, that uh, presidents direct federal spending in ways that are advantageous to their political standing. So, you know, the, executive branch is not outside of politics. So I think, you know, when we contemplate Congress's role that, you know, a system of checks and balances and, and, and Congress not, uh, you know, swearing off entirely any, any influence over this, this area is the appropriate place to stand. So, uh, you know, recognizing that, you know, that these, that these, these are, these are difficult questions and we, we have to, uh, we have to put in place safeguards to protect against corruption and that we need on an ongoing way to, you know, to, to examine reforms. But, uh, but uh, th there isn't any way to ensure that politics uh, you know, will never take into account political considerations. I mean, that, 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 it, 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 it's a definitional problem. So, uh, and, uh, I suppose on, on one small point as a rejoinder to thinking about the politics of the late 19th century and the giant tariff log roll, that that was also a time of very close and intense two-party competition. That there was, this was not a time when a single majority party faction had full control of United States government. That yes, this was this was how the structure of the 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 the, the politics of that time, but. Uh, Republicans did not manage to enshrine themselves in an unchallengeable way through the use of distributive politics. So competition, I think, uh, helps to drive reform and, um, and, and the, 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 the light that competition shines on government action uh, is, a, is a check on corruption. Can I just clarify very quickly yeah, that with, with, with regards to the 19th century, you know, the, the, the two parties were balanced equally nationwide by and large, but the, the, the regime that was put in place was primarily done so after the Civil War. And the, the main benefit of it um, really occurred, uh, the, the prime beneficiaries of it were mainly in uh, state political machines such as like Pennsylvania. Uh, where you had this ironclad political operation that basically existed from um, the 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 1870s all the way up to to the Great Depression into the, into the 30s. That the, the beneficiaries of this oftentimes were uh, not uh, the National Republican Party, whose margins um, up until the Panic of 1893 were narrow enough that they it, it wasn't sufficient. But it, it did sort of lock down key states within the industrial Midwest for uh, Republicans. Um, so you had party bosses like Matt Quay, for instance, and Tom Platt of New York who were able to sort of dominate their, uh, their states by virtue of their position in the Senate and the benefits that they were able to control through the federal government. And also you had the, uh, the, 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 the you know, you have a high, uh, very high status quo bias within uh, 
federal policy so that when these policies were implemented under Republican supermajorities, they became very difficult for uh, Democrats to dislodge despite their many efforts. So we're running over a bit, but we started a little bit late, and I, and I do want to give you all a chance to ask questions. So uh, if you'd wait for a mic and just identify yourself, and as we usually say, please ask a question. Uh, am I on? Good. Uh, Leslie Page with Citizens Against Government Waste, and as some of you may know, that we've made our entire, the last 20 some years of our lives working on this issue, and I, I believe Mr. Cost actually was using some of our data. Thank you for that. Um, obviously, we are very much opposed to this whole idea. I can't imagine any worse timing. Uh, you know, Congress is held in the lowest possible esteem, I think, that it has been in a long time, and this is their idea of a solution to the problem is to bring back earmarks, which is one of the things that contributed to its very low esteem among American taxpayers. And by the way, taxpayers aren't being mentioned very much uh, today, but I would like to say that I don't think they're really very sympathetic to the idea that members of Congress are a beleaguered bunch, who are the poor, poor, pitiful people, can't get anything done unless they're able to control 1% of a $3.8 trillion budget so they can do what they want with it. I will say that um, there's so much to talk about, but I'm not gonna monopolize. Jason mentioned processes for re reform. We have defined earmark by a process. If you look at our materials, we actually say that there are seven, seven criteria that make it an earmark, and all of those have to do with process, which is that authorization, hearings, you know, requested by both houses, or both Congress, and both Senate and House, coming from the administration, does it come out of the executive branch? I mean, this is one of the things that makes a particular project a problem is because it has absolutely no process involved. If you implement the process as it is supposed to be implemented, you will end up with, that's not an earmark in some ways, that is, that is actual appropriated spending. Uh, in which case, you know, I don't know, if you have all that, you won't have earmarks. Part of the problem with this whole thing is Congress cannot oversee spending. They don't do it. So I don't, I mean, you can implement it if you want, you can bring them okay. back, but uh, you know, past this prologue and you're gonna see the same problems I think rising again, which is lack of oversight and it's gonna yeah. be out of control before okay. you know it. Thank you. Th thank wanna... goodness somebody actually raised the other side of the discussion, so thank you for that. <laughs> so, does anybody have a comment? I just want to say thanks to the Citizens Against Government Waste, that annual pig book. I've relied on that. I've gone back through it. It's, and the, the, the fact that you've kept go doing it year after year. Yeah, I really appreciate that. So, uh, another question? In the back here. Hi. Um, I'm Tim Plannert from the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Um, my question is, Regarding earmarks, do you think there's a risk that even though the total number of mo amount of money being spent won't change, that it might lead to a reallocation from high value projects to lower value projects, and it might lead to less efficient u <coughs> sorry use of resources? It, it might. It could also result in a um, increase in the efficiency of the projects. Most members of Congress believe that they have some intimate knowledge of the people who elected them, and they would argue, in fact, that they are quite more attuned to the priorities of their districts than the large federal agencies. Um, so it, it might, but again, the status quo is not working. And so, you know, again, the idea that what we have right now is what we should protect is what's given us an incredibly low opinion about Congress. I, I would only add that I recognize there's a, a conundrum here, which is that bringing back earmarks would require political courage which the Congress has been deprived of by the lack of earmarks. So how one actually gets out of that um, cycle, I think, will be a challenge. I, I think that the problem that you, you bring up is a real one. I think that Congress has demonstrated pretty decisively over the course of its existence that it has the ability to proclaim uh, an intention to accomplish grand national designs, but has a uh, marked incapacity to actually plan how to bring them about. Um, and again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, you know, if you look at the tariff system of the 19th century is a classic example of how uh, 
uh, top line congressional planning initiative, which was, you know, begun after the War of 1812 to protect the national interest very quickly within the course of a decade devolved into basically just a cash grab. Um, saw the same thing with Smoot Hawley in 1930 as well. That this is, that's sort of my anxiety just in general, right? Is that Congress. Um, which is why I, I sort of impartial and why I mentioned Hume and why I mentioned Hamilton, because both of them were talking about controls independent of the Congress itself. Hamilton was looking for a way to get the executive branch to leverage the legislature. And when we're talking about the legislature controlling itself, that can and has spiraled out of control, historically speaking. Yeah, I'd love to hear your views on the tariff regime of the 21st century. So, uh, opposed. <laughs> so can I, I'm going to jump in now. So the other hat I wear here at AEI has to do with national security. And um, so I've been, uh, and that's what kind of jobs I had when I was in government. Um, but um, I'm reminded, when the, your question reminds me, there, years ago when uh, Newt Gingrich was, you know, the congressman from Georgia, um, every year uh, he would stick in, in defense earmarks, uh, more money for buying uh, military transport planes. And every year the, the White House and the Air Force would complain that, you know, these were things that weren't uh, being budgeted for. These were things that were going to um, mean there would be less monies for other parts of the Air Force program and so on. And one was sort of inclined to sort of say, well, yeah, well, okay, Newt's just acting like a congressman from, you know, Marietta, Georgia and pushing things. Well, you know, 9-11 came around, and all of a sudden, we didn't have enough transport planes. So, and on the other hand, I know a lot of decisions that the various administrations have made on very major programs, um, different, you know, major programs like the F-22, where people could argue they've made tragic mistakes. So, again, I'm not trying to oversell the, you know, uh, Newt Gingrich's uh, wisdom, uh, um, but I, I do think that there's less, I think there's less um, appreciation for how congressmen actually understand the subject areas that they're responsible for sometimes. And we give too much deference sometimes to the executive branch. So we have literally one more question if anybody has it, otherwise uh, my bosses are going to come in here and take my mic away, please. Mike's coming. I just wanted to, uh, Alan Johnson, I'm the, with the Citizens Against Government Waste as well. Um, I just wanted you all to maybe uh, comment on, in the 111th Congress, uh, 81 uh, House and Senate appropriators, or 15% of the Congress, uh, got 51% of the earmarks and 61% of the money. Uh, in Congress, as in nature, the big dogs always eat first. And so that's bad. We should have a rule that prevents that. And yet, uh, also, uh, your average House and Senate office had one staff member who was uh, did nothing but filled earmark requests. So they were a huge outsized uh, pain for very little benefit to your average member. So in what ways would you recommend sort of reforming that process a little bit more in depth and making it a little bit more equitable for all members of Congress instead of just a very select special few? I'd limit it to, to a member. That way you'd have about 1,000, which I think is um, a manageable amount. Um, and I think a lot of members um, would, based on their own um, view of principle, decide not to pursue earmarks, which is you know, good for them. But these aren't, I mean, these are problems, but they're not complicated problems. And I think the notion that we are stuck trying to defend a system that was broken is not kind of consistent with the way democracy is supposed to work. And I think I would just argue that there's, you know, the big dog's heat. When you back away and try to sort of understand exactly what that means, obviously there's downsides to it. But, but one of the things you want, I mean, we've gone through this process now where a lot of senators and congressmen are retiring. Um, and part of the problem, I would argue, not simply all of the problem, but part of the problem is the incentive structure for them to remain uh, and be successful in, uh, as congressmen. We keep taking away tools that that provide those incentives um, for seniority, for um, moving up committee ranks, and the like. Um, and so, even though you know one could argue in the short term um, that kind of you know 
the benefits going to them more so than to other members uh, seems uh, wrong. It's also the case that there's a secondary benefit um, to the Congress as an institution. I think that sometimes gets overlooked. Again, you you probably do want an earmark process that's been reformed, but I think we shouldn't be holier than thou about understanding how Congress works better when it has certain kinds of institutional privileges that, that make um, uh, ambitions in Congress um, better, not worse. Um, I know you want to ask a question, but... but no, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I really apo I apologize. We're running over. Uh, but uh, um, please join me in thanking our panelists because it was an excellent... <laughs>